Very well. What is it you want? Your fortune? Your future? I squirmed, not knowing what to say. She peered at me hard and asked again, What do you seek? Maybe it was the way she studied me so hard that made me feel like she could see right through me to the brocade wallpaper behind me. I didn't know what made me say what I said next. I wasn't quite sure what I meant by it. It just came out. I'm looking for my daddy. Her eyebrows went up. I see. Now we get somewhere. Do you have a bubble? Bubble? A totem, a trinket. Something your father may have touched. She puckered her lips and her already wrinkled face drew into more wrinkles. She probably knew darn well and good that I was missing Gideon's compass, and I wasn't parting with any more money. Besides, she was just an old woman full of beans anyway, so I decided to call her bluff. I pulled out the letter from Ned to Jinx that was folded in my back pocket. If Miss Sadie came up with some cock and bull story about my daddy from something that wasn't his, I'd know she was as phony as a two-headed nickel. I slid the paper over to her. Miss Sadie opened it, smoothing the yellow paper beneath her fleshy palms. As she looked at the words, her hands began to tremble. She held them to her face, and her, help, and her breath came out in short, shuddering gasp. For a moment, I couldn't decide if she was crying or dying, but then figured this must be part of her divining preparations. Finally, she lifted her head and touched the letter again, gently stroking the page with her palm, as if she was trying to draw the words into herself. The leather, she said, without looking at me. It mentions certain mementos. You must have these. There was something deep and old in her voice. It sounded like need. I remembered that the letter mentioned the silver dollar, fishing lure, and skeleton key. I found them in a Lucky Bill cigar box under a loose floorboard, I answered a little too quickly, and it made me sound guilty. There was the other stuff, too, I continued, over-explaining. An old cork and a tiny wooden baby doll, no bigger than a thimble, and all painted up in bright colors. I wish I could shut myself up. After a long pause, she rested her gaze on me, puckering her lips again in thought. She seemed to be weighing whether or not to go on, as if deciding if I was worthy of receiving, receiving her divination. Very well. Place your hands on the table. I will build a bridge between the world of the living and the dead. But my daddy is alive, I said, figuring she had just given herself away as a fate. The lines between the living and dead are not always clear. She closed her eyes and breathed slow and deep. I closed one eye, one eye and peeked out the other. It is time to reveal secrets of the future and past. I see a boy from long ago, she began. He is on a train. So far I wasn't impressed. The boy, he is a stranger to manifest. Where is he now, I asked, cutting to the chase. Silence! These spirits will not be rushed. Miss Sadie was working up a sweat. I had no idea it took such effort being a spirit conjurer. I stared wide open as the diviner began. The boy, he is tired and hungry. He must act now. He must take a leap of faith. Next chapter. Triple Toe Creek, Crawford County, Kansas, October 6, 1917. Jinx watched the ground rush by in late afternoon light. He jumped from enough boxcars to know that the jumping was easy was a landing that could present a problem. Figuring the cottonwoods along the creek would be a good place as any to hide out for a while, he grabbed his pack and leapt. Fortunately, he saw the ravine from midair. Rolling and tumbling, he tried to keep his pack so it wouldn't bang on the ground like every other part of him. Finally, he stopped, then listened. He heard a girl's voice just ahead. Ned Gillian, you only have one thing on your mind. If I had known why you brought me out here, well, I am a lady and I'll have no part of it, and maybe you should find someone else to take to the homecoming dance. Jinx peered over the bush in front of him just in time to see a young woman raising her parcel, parasol, and march off. <coughs> a boy, a young man really, with olive skin and dark wavy hair, was holding a catfish 
hooked on a line. After a moment, the boy stared into the catfish bulgy's eyes and cleared his throat. Pearl Ann, I apologize for compromising your femininity by exposing you to the rugged world of fishing. Would you please reconsider and do me the honor of accompanying me to the homecoming dance? The fish stared back, unmoved. Jinx was intrigued by the romantic scene developing before him, but he was even more enamored with the fish with the catfish wiggling on the hook. He knew he should hop another train to put more distance between him and the events from the night before. The sound of the sheriff's dogs barking and growling still rang in his ears, but his stomach was the only one growling now. Jinx hadn't eaten since the day before and could already smell the catfish sizzling on the spit. You're going to have to do more than sweet talk a fish, Jinx said, emerging from the bushes. Ned Gillian spun around and then relaxed when he saw it was just a boy. Is that right? And I suppose you would know in your, what, 12 years of experience with women? Thirteen, and it's not what I know, it's what I have. Jinx took a brown bottle from which, which had miraculously remained unbroken from his pack. You got all the right words to go after, but you can't smell, go smelling like catfish in creek water, can you? Ned sniffed the fish and grimaced. I suppose not. What I have here will solve your problems. It's a cologne, aftershave, and mouthwash all in one. It comes from the Arctic glacier waters, waters off the coast of Alaska. I got it from a hundred-year-old Eskimo medicine man. And where did you happen to run into a hundred-year-old Eskimo? I did some work at the docks in one. At any rate, if you can make a polar bear smell good, just think what it can do for you. Jinx jiggled the bottle. Time is of the essence, my friend. I suppose a little freshener up wouldn't hurt. But something tells me you're not in the business of giving away Arctic glacial water for free. Jinx pursed his lips. I suppose we could make a trade. Say, that catfish for your bottle? This is unless you're getting kind of sweet on her. Ned grinned and unhooked the fish, revealing a green and yellow spotted fishing hook. He held up the lure. It's brand new. They call it a wiggle king. So colorful to catch a blind fish. Anyway, I doubt that concoction is worth the fish and the lure. He handed the fish and took the bottle. I'll take good care of her, Jinx said as Ned left. The October night was still and mild as Jinx stretched out by the fire in his shorts, his belly full of catfish. He had rinsed out his clothes earlier to lessen their scent and hung them from a tree to dry. Jinx was exhausted, but he knew he should get moving. He'd hop the next train and head wherever it took him. Still, he reasoned, it might be a while before the next train came by. And he was close enough to the tracks to listen to the chug of an engine. So he eased himself into the cool creek, letting the dust and grind from there to here wash away. His Uncle Finn had suggested they split up in Joplin. They'd be harder to track if they were separate. Maybe that was the best thing to come out of the whole mess. Even on the run, Jinx felt a sense of freedom. For the first time, he felt like he could make a fresh start. Still, it was hard to make a fresh start when there was a dead body in your past. It had been an accident, but Finn had said no sheriff would believe that, and his dogs wouldn't care. Jinx leaned, leaned back into the water, letting the creek flow through his hair and between his fingers. The current gently pulled him, and he gave in to it. Maybe he'd go to Denver or San Francisco, some place where no one would notice a kid on the run. Some place even his Uncle Finn couldn't find him. But the blissful thought vanished as a figure splashed nearby. Cussing and muttering, someone was frantically scrubbing his hair and face. It was that fellow, Ned. Uh-oh, Jinx thought, noticing that Ned's build was strong and tall compared to his own shorter, wiry one. Jinx knew he should have moved on long before then. Unfortunately, Ned spotted him. Why, you little Arctic glacial water, you said. Makes a polar bear smell good, does it? It smells all right, and I'm sure Pearl Ann would agree. Before Jinx could retreat, Ned had him by the arm and looked about to drown him or punch him or both. And then a gunshot went off. Both boys froze. Get your clothes and come with me, Ned said. To his own surprise, Jinx obeyed. But when he went back to the tree where his clothes he had hung, they were gone. 
Only his shoes and socks stuffed in them were left. He ran back to catch up with Ned, who was also dressed in dripping shorts, holding only his shoes. They must have taken our clothes, said Ned. Come on. Whoops and hollers filled the night air. Jinx followed Ned about thirty yards up the creek. The two crouched low in the creek bed, still dripping and bare. As they peeked over the bank, heat from a bonfire struck them like a train. They saw greetings being passed from one man to the next. Hands were shaking and backs were slapped. Everything was brother this and brother that. It could have been a church meeting if not for the white hoods and cloaks. The scene made Jinx shiver. They're using our clothes for kindling, Ned pointed to the bonfire. A hooded figure tossed their shirts into the crackling blaze while another laughed. Why would they want to burn our clothes? They're drunk and they're mean, and that's a dangerous combination. Ned pulled Jinx away from the bank. Let's get out of here. Besides, I still have a debt to settle with you. But who are they, and why do they wear sheets and hoods, Jinx whispered. They had already caught a whiff of Ned's glacial scent and was no hurry to settle that debt. The so-called glacier water smelled one way in the bottle, and a whole lot different once it hit a person's skin. But usually Jinx was long gone by then. Ned looked at Jinx like he was born yesterday. Jeez, kid, you've been in Alaska too long. They call themselves the Ku Klux Klan, and they pretty much hate everyone who isn't like them. If you have the wrong color, religion, or birthplace, they don't like you. Around here, it's mostly foreigners they hate. Ned's face, face flushed with anger. They wear hoods because they don't want anyone to know who they are. Like that one with the crooked arm who threw his clothes in the fire. That's Buster Holt. He's a knacker. A fellow who carts off dead animals. He hates foreigners, but he doesn't mind taking their money to pick up their dead cows and horses. The other one laughing like a girl, that's Elroy Nab. He's one of the bosses at the mine, but if his wife found out he was here drinking and carousing, well, let's just say Mr. Nab is wicked with a ro Miss Nab is wicked with a rolling pin. Just then, two men stepped away from the fire and took off their hoods. Who are those two, Jinx asked, his eyes wide, and how come they took their hoods off? The big one's Arthur Devlin. He's the Grand Knight, and he's the one who owns the mine. The other one is the pit boss, Lester Burton, Ned answered, his voice charged with anger. Devlin doesn't care who comes to see him because he doesn't have to answer to anybody. They all answer to him. Around here, who owns the mine pretty much owns the town. Everybody has to come crawling to him, his mine, his company store. And believe me, his wages and his prices, he makes sure you stay on your knees. Ned took a slow breath and whispered, Come on, let's get out of here. Ned moved away and Jinx followed. Be careful, kid. There's poison ivy along the break. Let's wade downstream and get out through that clearing.